Our uh, text this morning comes uh, from the Old Testament reading in Leviticus 19. I uh, just want to review that last verse, verse 18. It says, you shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. This is our text. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I was listening to these words and I was remembering, <clears throat> I got to take you back again uh, into this strange life of mine. I had, uh, well, when I was really little, I think maybe three, might have been four, uh, I had uh, two sisters at the time. I still have two sisters, but I don't like to think of them any more than is necessary, especially from those days. But it, what, what happened is uh, we the parents were out. I don't remember what they were doing. We had a babysitter, uh, and uh, there was this problem we had in our house where nobody was supposed to go behind the couch. Now, I don't know really, even to this day, exactly what my mother was thinking when she said, don't go behind the couch. So naturally, since the babysitter did not know we weren't supposed to go behind the couch, we all went behind the couch, right? That's what you do. There was room enough back there for us to crawl around. So uh, my older sister went through there and without incident, that seemed like fun. So I went through there too and that went okay. Uh, then my little sister who was just barely two crawled back through there. And, uh, and apparently she bumped the plug of one of the lights because there were some cords back there. You know, she bumped one of the plugs and eased it out of the socket a little bit and, and it sent out a little bit lightning bolt at her and burnt her pajamas and she had a little burn on her leg and we all had a heart attack. Because you know, at that point we were thinking, okay, there's no way we're gonna get away with this because mom is gonna come home and you know, there's gonna know. So, uh, we knew we weren't supposed to go back there and we did it anyway, not knowing why we weren't supposed to do it because people, you know, when you're three, people don't tell you stuff. Uh, and to this day, I still don't know why she said don't go back there, but we did and we got burnt and we didn't do it ever again because it didn't go well when mom got home. So uh, aside from that, it was a little scary too, but see that what happens is you get these things where you don't really know what the command is for and, uh, and it gets to be a little bit of a confusion and sometimes you're tempted to find out. Uh, such is what we get here in Leviticus. Uh, this book is part of the covenant of Moses as they, they spent a lot of time getting it because there was a lot of stuff in there. Uh, and, uh, and it was given, I guess, most especially to the Levites, thus the name Leviticus, right? They went to the Levites who were the, I guess, the teaching and ministry family of the people of God at the time. And they were supposed to teach the people how they're supposed to live by these words when they enter into the promised land. This is the whole thing. You are going to be my God, and we're going to be your people, and we're supposed to behave a certain way, so you get all this Leviticus stuff. Um, this particular little bit is focused on how they shall treat each other when they get there. Uh, I, I guess maybe if you wanted to get real technical, it's more like how they're not supposed to treat each other <laughs> when they get there. Uh, the kingdom of God looks like you don't do this stuff. So like always, God, uh, I, I don't know if you've noticed this, but God never seems to command anything that is easy. It's always the hard stuff. It's always the stuff that you don't want to do. He never ever seems to tell you to do something that you want to do, like eat ice cream or go behind the couch or whatever, you know, and, and uh, so you get stuck with these things that are difficult and often not particularly desirable, and, and here they sit. Um, but they're always difficult. And, and on top of that, in, in case you missed it, there were, uh, at the end of each one of these little statements, uh, it says, I am the Lord, or in the case of the first one, I am the Lord your God. You sort of have to pay attention to that because he has the authority to say these things. It doesn't come from Moses. It doesn't come from the Levites. It comes 
from the Lord your God. That's where these words are from. He signs his name on it. Now, on the other hand, it says the Lord and it says your God. Uh, there are some good things in there. If you look at the part that says the Lord, uh, if you look under there in the Hebrew, you find the I am name under there, which was given to his people to call on him when he was needed for whatever reason. Uh, when they, and he promised that if you call on that name, you'll be saved. Well, that's a, that, that's a uh, what would you say, a hidden sort of gospel here. These things are for you. And also it says your God, which is his title of power, which has all the authority wrapped up in it. And this is the part that says, you better pay attention here because I know what I'm talking about and you don't. So I guess you could say all the bases are covered. It's good for you, but it's also a little hard. I suppose it wouldn't take long to find yourself in this list of commands. Sometimes we don't really want to look that close, but I'm going to make you look anyway. Uh, for instance, how well do you look after the poor? Uh, this says sojourner, uh, which kind of means uh, transient, somebody that's passing through. How well do you look after them? That's the first thing that makes me think about it. Uh, I know how that goes because it's hard. Uh, any, I probably shouldn't even ask this. Did any of you ever tell a lie? I, I know you married guys. You always do this, so there's no escaping it. Um, you never probably have caught your wives in that, but uh, we lie. That's what we do. It's a thing that human beings do to protect themselves or to keep from having to hurt somebody's feelings or whatever. So do you lie? Yeah, you lie. He says, don't lie. Um, Ever favor a friend over somebody else when you probably shouldn't have done that just because they're your friend? Or did you ever defer to someone who was a little bit famous or a little bit powerful or whatever just because it's easier to do it that way? Uh, and you like to fawn on power, you know, that's somewhat, we do this almost automatically and I know it happens. Um, but, but, you know, that sort of thing interferes with fairness and so God says, don't do that. Um, ever get to hating somebody, got really, really mad, hollered at them. I'm thinking husbands again. I shouldn't be thinking this way, huh? but I, I mean, it's just real life. Sometimes you get mad at people. Uh, and, and I suppose it's that close to hating them, even if you don't want to admit it, uh, cause it says, don't do that. This is just basic stuff. It's not complicated stuff. There's nothing here in these paragraphs that you know, uh, that, that you weren't aware, that you weren't supposed to do. It's there and it's obvious and it comes from God and you know it's there. It's how you're supposed to start loving your neighbor, which is where he ends up. All of this stuff, every single word is about how you love your neighbor or rather how you don't not love your neighbor. That's kind of the way the words come. And, and this is mostly only stuff that you know you're not supposed to do. And I would suppose, for the most part, knowing that God doesn't want you to do them, you try not to. But you know, there's the thing, it doesn't really say what loving your neighbor actually looks like. It only says what it doesn't look like. And, and this is a, a particularly different problem, but it's not like we don't recognize it. Uh, uh, we do this stuff sometimes, especially when we're angry or we're, we're eth with a perceived enemy or whatever. Things can get difficult to keep in the rules that God has laid out for us about loving our neighbor. And of course, it's so much better, so much better when you see uh, I am the Lord tagged on the end because, you know, you, when you do this stuff, you know, you're crossing God, not just crossing somebody else. God said, don't do this. And you did this. The first commandment's out the window. Uh, and, and this is uh, a little scary. And if it seems a little hopeless to cover even the easy stuff that you already know how to do, because I know that we all mess that up a little bit at very least. Uh, it makes it much worse when you don't know how to do what you're supposed to do. Because sometimes when he throws out there, uh, 
love your neighbor as yourself, you don't even know what you're actually supposed to do to take care of that because there is some confusion and there is some ignorance and there is some false perception and there is some other emotional stuff that gets in the way. And, uh, and then he says, I am the Lord, just to make sure you're miserable. It, it, it's not entirely obvious, but you really need to look at this just a little bit different way. I want you to look and see how God loves you in all this. Now, I know that it's not your first thought when you see that stuff, but it, it's not so much the demands that he makes uh, that I want you to look at. Those are there, and you are supposed to pay attention to them. But uh, if you can see that these commands, among all the others, uh, that they're concerned with the way you live your life, with people around you, uh, they're all there about protecting God's neighbors. Now, I know this is not the sort of thing you usually think about, but if you hope, um, uh, just a little see of hands here, how many of you have seen your small catechism in the last month? Awesome, there's three out of a bunch. Huh? <laughs> Life is complicated. Sometimes you don't get to look at your catechism, but in your catechism, whenever you get to the 10 commandments, they're all kind of hard to deal with. But it, it, for some reason, Luther, he sticks a little parenthetical statement there next to each one of them. And he doesn't really say anything in the small catechism about what it's there for. But it's supposed to tell you that God gave you this command, same as all these commands, to protect some the gift that he's given you. So he tells you what the gift is. So, for instance, on that first commandment, there's this little thing there that says God. Well, why does it say that? Well, it says that because he has given you himself to be your God. This is his gift to you. So he says what, you're, what, what the commandment is there to protect for you is this gift of him being your God. So he says, don't have any other gods. That sounds kind of obvious when you put it like that. That's what it's for. It's there to protect the gift. These commands are all like that. In this particular case, we're protecting God uh, as he is protecting his neighbors. Uh, when I say neighbors, uh, you happen to be, as it turns out, his neighbors. He sees it that way. Uh, there is a blessing to you in these things, in these commandments, even though they might well make you miserable when he says, I am the Lord, it, they're there for you. God loves you beyond all reckoning, even to include such things as this. He's there protecting you from others who sin, and he's there protecting others because you sin, and those things are supposed to keep you to some extent from doing stuff like this. Now, when you look at it like that as a protection for you and for people around you, then it is a wondrous gift uh, because he is aware of your sin. I, uh, this is not the sort of thing you think about a lot until you get to a commandment that says something you're not supposed to do and you do and he says, I am the Lord, then you start thinking about it. But here we have all these things that are wondrous gifts because he knows you sin and because it's a problem for you and he needs to protect you, which is all he ever wants to do. And he shows all the more how God loves a neighbor by protecting you this way, by giving you these rules, or at least that's part of his purpose. It's to protect you even from his own wrath that he sends his son into the world because you have this sinfulness that needs to be dealt with, which is due justly the wrath of God to destroy you and drop you into hell. But instead of that, to protect you, which he does all the time, because that's what he does with his neighbors, he stands his own son in the path of that wrath, hangs him on a cross and kills him. But in this thing, even in this horror, you are forgiven completely in Christ's sacrifice. This is him protecting you even from himself. In his rising, there is promise for your eternal life also. That's how Christ loves his neighbor, how he loves you. 
And if that were not enough, he also sent his Holy Spirit to live in you. Because, you know, uh, this is a surprise to me personally, because I know who I am and what I am. We're all horrible sinners from day to day, a million times. This, you know, uh, if you were wondering about that, he says, I am the Lord. And he says a whole bunch of stuff you don't want to talk about. Uh, but there you are, sinner, with the Holy Spirit of God living in you right now. That loving, encouraging spirit of power does battle even within you as you walk around from day to day because your desires are sinful, but he does battle for you as he lives right there inside of you to protect you and others with you from that sinful desire by inspiring and encouraging you to do what is good, to believe this word of stuff that he lists out here for you to be good and he encourages you to obey, to restrict your desire to sin, instead bringing forth in good works because that's what faith does and the spirit that's in you wants you to do what is loving both for your god and for your neighbors so that's the way he inspires you you notice i said what you do not what you feel that the loving thing has got nothing much to do with what you feel because well i mean uh he says that horrible stuff like love your enemy uh, it's not the easiest thing to do, to love your enemy. In fact, it's pretty much impossible. He isn't talking about how you feel. He's talking about what you do, what you do to your neighbor, whether you like him or not. God inspires these things by the spirit that lives in you to do what is good. That is the love that he demonstrates, and so he inspires it in you. This is a, a so pronounced, more than you really probably have thought about in the world, that that even those who do not know God are somewhat protected because God loves his people, the ones that are already his and the ones that might yet come. He, uh, well, you're protected in his holy hand by what he says to you, what he inspires in you, and by his presence in the kingdom in you because things are better where the kingdom of God is. You, as it turns out, are still sinners. It isn't going away, at least not in this life, but beyond that, in spite of that, in the protection of everything that he loves, he loves in you. He loves you, but he loves in you, and he loves the world in Christ through you as you walk around in this world his own. Uh, what, what I'm trying to get you to do is don't trust yourself in this thing because you yourself cannot do it. But trust God to act in you and through you to love his world, to protect his world for his own dear children. Uh, you got that story about the Good Samaritan, which I'm sure you've heard many, many times. It's always a little bit of a surprise to me because when you get to the end of the thing, uh, he, he gets to the love your neighbor as yourself thing in the middle uh, or at the toward, at the beginning of this. But at, by the time you get to the end, you find out the Samaritan isn't the guy who just does good stuff. He is, in fact, the neighbor. Which is a little weird because I'm always a little surprised by that. But, what, but this is what happens. Uh, even Christ's enemies who don't particularly like him know that the Samaritan, the guy they don't like at all because he's a Samaritan, and the, 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 the two guys that are supposed to know better, they didn't do what they're supposed to do, but he did. They understand that that is being a neighbor. What I want you to understand is when Christ talks about that, he's not talking about you being the Samaritan because you know better. He's talking about him being the Samaritan because he loves whatever it takes all the way to the end of the road, no matter how dangerous or difficult or scary it is, that's what Christ does to love his neighbor, which is, as it turns out, you. Now, I, uh, there's this little passage all the way over in 1 John that says God cannot deny himself. And this is connected in, in, the, in this peculiar way. When, when God sees you, he sees his son. See, it's actually, he sees his neighbor as himself. <laughs> he sees you 
as himself, Christ, who he cannot deny. He loves you because he sees his son who died for you. He loves you because, well, he wants to. And, and the whole plan was to get you home, to save you from your sin, to protect you and your neighbors from each other by giving you these things, these great gifts, and inspiring you to do better. That is the life he has given you. And it just waits for the eternal one to be perfected so that these things never are a problem again. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.